She leaned forward eagerly and licked Rugby right on the nose. That's a very complex sentence. Comprehension is a very important part of the job of a K-5 to teacher, and it's not a job that should wait until later elementary school, as some people believe. This is really a part of the job from kindergarten on, is making sure that we're developing children's comprehension of tasks. Jasmine, what's the name of our story? The rope tug. And is it a story or a play? It's a play. Another important piece that's overlooked a lot is developing K-5 students' knowledge of different kinds of text. We have very, very different kinds of text in schools that children need to learn to read and write, and the ways we read and write them are different. So we want to make sure that children develop the knowledge of these very different types or genres of text. Another important and often overlooked area of literacy development is motivation and engagement. We would not be doing our jobs if we sent students out of K-5 to knowing how to read but not wanting to do so. So we have an important job as educators to make sure that we're really developing students who are motivated and engaged to read. So they also need to understand why we read and write because, of course, that's what's going to get them involved in wanting to read and write to begin with is to understand the very many purposes that literacy can serve in our lives. One of the things that we're seeing is that we have a sort of a disconnect between what teachers want to include in the classroom curriculum and what students like. There was one really interesting study where the researcher asked students in several grade levels to indicate the books they would most like to read. Then they asked the teachers of those same students what, um, what books would the students like to read. And it turned out that the teachers thought the students would want to read mostly fiction, whereas the students were actually fairly balanced in their interest in reading either fiction or nonfiction. So what we see here is a disconnect, um, and what we don't know exactly why this is occurring, but we have some ideas. One is that some teachers actually really prefer reading fiction themselves, and so they assume that therefore the children that they're working with also um, prefer to read fiction, and certainly some do, but some do not, and many like to read both fiction and nonfiction texts. So that's one possible cause. Another possible cause is that some teachers believe that young children can't handle informational text, that it's developmentally inappropriate for them. Um, we now have quite a number of research studies done um, using different methodologies and with different kinds of research um, purposes and, and context. And over and over again, what we're finding from this research is that young children can and do interact with successfully with informational text if we give them a chance to do so. So we have a pretty good understanding now that informational text can be developmentally appropriate for young children. It really can and should be an integral part of instruction in K-5 classrooms. So I'm going to be listening in my head when I'm reading for the beginning, the middle, and the end, but I'm also going to be really paying attention to what the characters are doing, where they're doing it, and what the big problem and solution are. I like the Rand Report definition of reading comprehension, which is the process of simultaneously constructing and extracting meaning through interaction and involvement with written language. Part of that definition that's really important is this difference here between extracting meaning from text and constructing meaning with text. So we used to think that comprehension was just a matter of taking meaning that's on the page and just somehow getting it off the page. We now understand that reading comprehension is really this process of transacting with the text where you have what's on the page, surely, but also what's in the reader's mind, their background knowledge, their purpose for reading, their goals for reading, and so on. So really what we're doing is constructing meaning as much as we are extracting meaning from text. We have a really wonderful body of research on what good readers do when they read. We know a lot about it. We know, for example, that good readers are very, very active when they read. Their minds are constantly going. They're not simply getting the words off the page, but they're really constructing the meaning as they read, and they're using strategies to do so. For example, a good reader doesn't just open up a book and start reading on page one. A good reader is already thinking, why am I reading this book? Is this book going to meet the needs that I have? They've previewed the text in some way. They've thought about what the text is about. They've thought about what they know in relation to the text. They're doing all this kind of thinking before they even embark on the actual reading process. So you see that good readers are very, very active. They're very opinionated. Several of the studies that we have on what good readers do when they read shows that they're constantly evaluating the text and reacting to it, not only intellectually, but also emotionally. The research on what good readers do when they read is really valuable, I think, to me as a teacher and to other teachers I've worked with because it helps us know what we're aiming for. What is it that we're trying to develop in students? We're trying to develop these same active, strategic kinds of processes in the students that we work with.
Reading comprehension is really the end goal, along with motivation and engagement, for the K-5 to teacher of reading. That is, reading comprehension is what we're aiming for. We do, and we need to, spend lots of time teaching sound letter relationships, teaching fluency, teaching concepts of print, but all that teaching is really just in the service of trying to develop good comprehension, rather than the end in itself. In fact, I sometimes talk about skills like knowledge of sound letter relationships, fluent reading, as enabling skills, because really what they're doing is enabling the student to develop good comprehension. We worked on a skill called cause and effect. And remember, what does cause mean? Well, many scholars make a distinction between what we call mastery constructs and what we call growth constructs. A mastery construct is one where you really can pretty much master it. So for example, being able to decode words eventually becomes almost a mastery construct. We can do it with nearly any word once we become very good at it. Other constructs are growth constructs, and one of those is comprehension. This means that we'll really be developing as comprehenders throughout our lives. We'll never master comprehension. It will always be something that we need to continue to work on and grow from. For example, although I am a very good comprehender in many respects, if you hand me an IRS tax manual, I become not a very good comprehender. And so you can see there how, in some sense, this is something that we'll develop throughout our lives. It's really important for teachers to recognize this difference between mastery and growth constructs because in the classroom so much of what we're doing, especially in K-2, really does fall more in the category of a mastery construct. And we need to recognize that with comprehension, it's something that we're going to need to keep working on, not just in K-2, but K-5 to and well beyond. And that this is something that's complex enough, challenging enough, that really it's, a, it's going to be a part of the child's lifetime of learning and reading.